Yeah, that's how it is. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. It gives me great joy to be able to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, Sarah Hayford, who's giving a talk on uh, today's talk on life birth weights. Uh, well, I guess I know, that's the yeah. title. <laughs> A, a wonderful uh, childbearing and uh, good parenting and so forth. Um, her title is phrased much better. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Sarah Hayford is a professor at Ohio State studying family formation and reproductive health, and primarily in the United States and Sub-Saharan Africa. She's interested in how people uh, make plans about these behaviors and who is able to carry out these plans. Recent and current research topics include determinants of unintended uh, childbearing in the United States and policy impacts on reproductive health access and outcomes in Ohio. She has worked on a variety of multidisciplinary, uh, multi uh, institutional, and uh, cross national teams. Uh, she has done uh, quite a bit of work in places like Mexico, uh, Mozambique, and Nepal. Uh, uh, Dr. Hayford is uh, has a lot of funding from NIH, uh, private foundations, as well as C grants from our home institution, Ohio State University. Uh, she has a BA in French and, um, and a math from Amherst uh, College and an MA and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. So here, without further ado, is Sarah Hayward. Thank you very much, Kate. I don't know that I've um, been welcomed with joy so many times, but joy is a great emotion. Um, I am very happy to be here. Is, can you click in the thing? I can't. Um, should I? I think if you just click in PowerPoint, I'm not sure what the. Click in PowerPoint? Okay. okay. And then now just how to share. Yes. Uh, share. <laughs> My tech. Presentation style. Yes. So here's my nicely phrased <laughs> title. Um, and I also want to show this slide because I want to make sure I acknowledge my collaborators. As I've told some of you today, this is the first qualitative work I've ever done in my career. So, you know, I'm talking about it in public, which is a big step. Um, and I did this with two graduate students at Ohio State, Anna Church and Chloe Dunstan, from whom I learned a lot about qualitative research, um, and my longtime collaborator, Karen Guzzo. Uh, University of North Carolina. Um, I was funded by the OSU Department of Sociology to do this, and I got a lot of advice and encouragement from my colleague, Rin Rizik, um, who has a lot more qualitative experience than I do. Um, so I'm excited to talk about this here in public. I'm excited for your feedback, and especially around which of this sounds distinctive to the United States, and which of this sounds more generalizable to other low fertility contexts, um, other high income low fertility contexts. Um, so this figure is a kind of like big picture motivation for this talk. This is birth rates in the United States from about 2000 to 2022. Levels of birth rates in the United States are a little higher than in a lot of rich countries, but the general shape of this figure looks pretty similar. So what you see is pretty stable birth rates up around, up until around the Great Recession in 2007. And the US actually birth rates have been stable from like the mid 80s until the Great Recession. Um, at levels around two children per woman. There was a big decline in birth rates during the Great Recession, which was expected. We know from a lot of theory and previous research that birth rates go down when economic times are hard. And then demographers expected that after the Great Recession was over and sort of economic times had stabilized, that people would start having children again. Um, but that's not what happened. Birth rates declined steadily from about 2008 until 2022. There was a little bit of blip during the pandemic but birth rates in the US now are as low as they've ever been in history. And that steady decline after the recession, a recession fall in birth rates and then continued decline and no recovery is common across most high income countries as well. So in the big picture, what we're trying to understand is what's happening. Why aren't people having children? Why didn't birth rates go back up again when the way we expected them to after the great recession? Um, and in some ways, that, like, that's a really easy question to answer. Like if you ask people, like, why aren't people having kids? Everybody has 10 answers, right? Yeah. Kids are expensive, kids are challenging. But it turns out it's not the case that people don't want to have children. Um, this is data from nationally representative US surveys about what people in their early 20s say they plan to have in terms of children. So this is women on the left, men on the right. 
average intended parity, so the average number of children people say they plan to have when they're 20. And you can say, it's, see, it's right around two for both women and men. Um, it's declined a little in the past few birth cohorts. So these are birth cohorts from the 1960s birth cohorts. These are people having kids in the 80s and 90s to the 2000s birth cohorts who are having kids now. So there's been a little decline in recent years, but there's not a big decline. There's not as much decline in intentions as there is in outcomes. And the sort of timing of decline in intentions doesn't match the timing of decline in outcomes. So when people are in their 20s, they say they plan to have children. When people get into their 30s and 40s, they aren't having those children. And so that's a question of, or is something blocking them from having children? Are they just changing their minds as they go along? What's kind of happening in the early 20s that helps us think about this pattern of birth rates? Um, so there are lots of reasons, as I said, not to have children. In some ways, the more pressing question is, why do people have any children at all when children are expensive, when they don't do you any good, they don't support you when you're old, they don't earn money for you? Um, there's a lot of writing on this. I picked these two articles, honestly, because I like the titles. But the explanation that demographers have come up with as to why people want to have children is basically that people want to be parents, which sounds like circular reasoning. But what I mean by that is people want the social identity of parenthood. They want the social role of parenthood. They want the social relationship of parenthood. Both they want the relationship with their children that parenthood brings. And they want kind of the relationship with their communities or the identity in their communities that parenthood brings. So what we're really trying to do with this project is to understand how people think about parenthood before they have children. Because if that's a driving force, then that has to be something that exists before the child happens, this idea of what being a parent is like or what it means to be a parent or why we become a parent. And it turns out that um, there's a lot of sociological literature on what parents do and how parents think about parenting. There's a lot of sociological literature that describes variation in parenting, so variation across social class lines, variation by race and ethnicity, variation in how men and women approach parenting. Um, but all of this is research that's carried out among people who already have children, so among people who are actually parenting. And I guess what I'm arguing here, what we're arguing in this project, is that people's decisions about whether and when to have children are also likely to vary across some of these same lines. And you would think that they would be related to how people parent, but we don't actually know that. Like, we don't know before people have children, do they have a plan for how they're gonna parent? Do their plans for parenting vary in the same way that actual parenting behavior way it varies? Um, and so what the big picture question that we're trying to ask here is whether there's a connection between how young people who don't have children think about parenting and how they're deciding whether and when to have children. So I'm going to sort of talk about two more specific questions today. First, do people who don't have children think about parenting? Do they have ideas about what it means to be a good parent? Is this even something that's on their mind before they have children? And second, are these ideas about parenting connected to their more concrete desires and plans about whether they want to have children and when and in what circumstances they want to have children? So to answer these questions, we did in-depth interviews with childless young adults age 18 to 24. The idea of focusing on this relatively young age group is we wanted to get people really before they're thinking like in concrete ways about having children. So really sort of at the early stage of family formation. This is an age group when young people are making decisions about education, when they're making decisions about jobs, when they're making decisions about romantic relationships. And we wanted to hear how they were thinking about parenthood in the context of these other decisions, but before they've started to actually have these experiences. So we really wanted to get at the ideals, not the behavior. Um, and this is a time, you know, so in the US, the current mean age at first birth for women right now is around 27. Um, so this 18 to 24 age group is, you know, before that age. But birth rates in the 20 to 24 age group in the US are relatively high. There are, you know, obviously the mean age is in the middle. Lots of people have children before that. So this is a time when some people are having children or beginning to think about having children. So it's also like not totally out of the realm of possibility. This is an age where people are making decisions. Um, so our big picture goals are to describe how young people think about being a parent and then to connect those both to their past, their experiences in their own families, how they were raised, family of origin, um, socioeconomic status, and to relate those to their plans for the future. Um, and I should say very clearly, a lot of my work is about the relationship between intentions and outcomes. 
we don't have any illusions that what young people say about how they're going to parent is actually how they're going to parent. So like we're not like the, the outcome is not of interest here. What's really interest is the model and how these ideas might influence their behavior and decisions. Um, so our interview guide kind of had three sections. One talking about what they're doing now and what they plan to do in the future and kind of the connection between those. So if they're in school, what are they studying? How do they think that's going to affect their future work? If they're working, do they think this is a long-term job or you know, a stepping stone to the next thing? Um, are they dating? Are they interested in getting married? Sort of plans for the future in a lot of different domains. We asked about their childhood experiences, so both just sort of like you know, demographic things of what did your family look like when you were growing up? Were your parents together? Did you have siblings? And more questions about how their parents parented and how, you know, did they think their parents did a good job or not such a good job? And then we asked them for ideas about good parenting. And we asked that in a bunch of different ways. So we asked them about their own parents. We asked them about their plans for parenting. We asked them just a sort of general question, what do you think a good parent does? What do you think a child needs from their parents? So we tried to sort of triangulate in a bunch of different ways how they were thinking about parenting. Um, our sample frame was black and white young adults living in the Columbus, Ohio metropolitan area. We focused on black and white young adults because those are the two big ra biggest racial and ethnic groups in Columbus. Um, and we, we recruited, you know, we recruited on college campuses, we put signs up in coffee shops and in grocery stores. Um, our goal was to recruit young adults with a range of backgrounds and future plans, and we had some mixed success on that, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we conducted 36 interviews, most of them on Zoom. We did that, um, sort of we started off in 2021, like just on the tail end of the pandemic when a lot of people are still home. Um, and then it turns out people got used to Zoom um, and liked doing those, uh, you know, liked having on Zoom rather than having to go somewhere to be interviewed. Uh, interviews ranged in length from about half an hour to just over two hours. Uh, the analysis is still kind of in progress, um, but we did sort of went through multiple stages of notes after each interview, talking to each other, memoing, um, and then some more um, sort of structured coding um, in in vivo. Um, I'm trying to think, was there anything else I wanted to say? I should say also, I'm totally happy to be interrupted at any point. Um, if you ask me a hard question, I might put it off to the end, but feel free to ask it. I'm happy to take questions at any point. So sample composition, we had 36 participants. Um, the, about two thirds were women. This is, I think, common to a lot of social science research. Mm -hmm. Women are more eager to volunteer for this kind of thing than men are. Um, slightly more than half the sample was white, slightly less than half the sample was black or African American. Um, the mean age was 21. Our target was age 24, but we had somebody who had a birthday between the like, <laughs> recruitment <laughs> survey and the interview. Um, and about half and half divided between middle and upper class family backgrounds and working class or poor family backgrounds. These labels are our labels. They don't come from the participants themselves. And they're based on how the participants describe their parents' education and employment when they were growing up um, and how participants describe what finances were like in their families growing up. Were they stressful? Did they worry? Or were they pretty easy and not a source of worry? Um, so this is where the sort of concerns over the sample composition come in. 26 of our participants were either currently enrolled or had already graduated from four-year colleges. Nine were currently enrolled in two-year colleges. We only had one participant who wasn't currently enrolled in school. And this is, you know, in the U.S., about two-thirds of young adults enroll in a post-secondary institution right after high school. So this is not so far off the U.S. average, but it is more educated than average in the U.S just because it's easier to recruit people who are attached to institutions. Um, so that's something that to consider as we're thinking about our interpretation, but we do have much more range in the background of students than in their kind of future plans and future orientation. Okay, so the first question I wanna talk about is do people who don't have children have ideas about what it's like to be a parent? And so as I said, we asked about this in a bunch of different ways. Um, and as you would expect, some of these, you know, some people had much more articulate ideas about this than other people. And some people, you can sort of see them thinking about this question as, as we're asking it, they've like never really thought about parenting before. So Andrew, for example, 23 year old white man from a middle class family who had graduated from a four year college and he was working. So the interviewer asked him, so in general, what do you think it means to be a good parent? 
And Andrew says, I think the big, some of the best, the biggest stuff in terms of being a good parent is, that's tough. I've never had kids. Um, listening. Listening to the kids is, I'm sure, a big one. Being caring and being loving. I feel like you do those two or three things. You can probably, like, you can be, you can have a really good relationship with your kids. So Andrew has something to say about it, but it doesn't sound like this is on the tip of his tongue. He's like working through it. Um, but if you ask participants, for example, what did your parents do that you thought was good? And what did your parents do that you thought was not so good? If you ask them, what, do you, what are some people around you who you think are doing a good job being parents? If you ask them, what do you think kids need or what did you need when you were growing up? They do have answers to those questions. And there's a lot of similarities in their answers to these questions. Um, so, for example, Ginger says, your job as a parent is to raise this individual, cultivate what they like, support them and stuff, and help them be the best person that they can be, not the best person that you want them to be. Uh, Nathan says, I mean, it's hard to give a blanket statement, right? Because so many kids are so different, right? But I think overall kids need, they need support. They need a support system, they need a safe environment where they can be themselves. They need love and acceptance no matter what, what mistakes they make. And they need someone to coach and cheer for them and encourage them to go, grow. So you can see here this idea of support is common, this idea of letting them choose, not imposing, but letting kids be individuals. Different kids need different things. Um, Emma says, just making sure that you know, the kids' needs are met, met, and not just like food and shelter, that emotional needs are being met. And being a good parent is being able to pick up when, even without them telling you that like, there's something going on. This was actually something like almost in these exact words that we heard from a lot of participants, that parents know what's going on with their kids without the kids having to say it, that parents are paying attention, that parents are in tune with their children. June says, I think respect goes both ways. Yes, you're an adult, and yes, you're a parent, but I think in a relationship, respect and trust goes both ways. It really can't be one-sided, because then I feel like that becomes a controlling relationship, if you understand what I mean. And again, this idea of respect, the idea that the child is an individual, you treat them as an individual, you don't talk down to them as a parent, but you respect them and treat them as an equal. This just seems like so different from the research on how parents actually parent, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, and it's quite, you know, it's quite striking that everybody has these very shared ideas, and then there's huge variation in like, well, did your parents do that for you? Like, right. no. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then, but this is, you know, th these sort of things around respecting individuality, like both in terms of like not treating me like my brother just because we're both your kids, and in terms of like not imposing your goals on your kids. Um, support is a, like everybody talked about support in this very broad, like emotional support, helping with homework, like financial support, very big picture support. Being there emotionally phys and physically, and being, you know, sort of being present and also like listening and paying close attention to kids. So this is what kids want from their own parents. And this is what, if they're asked sort of like, ideally this is how I would like to parent or plan to parent. Um, there are some areas where there was less consensus in the sample. So there's a range of perspectives around discipline and especially like whether physical discipline was ever appropriate. And there's a range of of ideas about the balance between structure and flexibility. So everybody says like kids need some structure, but also you need to be flexible in some ways. But the ways people weight those sort of two ends of the spectrum varies a lot. Were there gender differences in the responses? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I'll come to that in a little bit, but it, not in any very clear way, okay. interestingly. Um, the other thing to note, I, I said this to somebody this morning. These people are 18 to 24. Most of them are pretty far away from parenting. They're not really talking very much about the practicalities of parenting. They're talking about money, but like they're not talking about the carpool. Like they're not talking about sleep training. Like they're not talking about like the nitty gritty of parenting for the most part. So they're really focused on these emotional parts of parenting. So were, are they tuned in at all to like TikTok memes about parenting? Because like, so the Ezra Klein show yesterday was talking about, um, why people are having kids later. And one of the things that they were raising is that a lot of people who don't have kids are watching these things on social media and they're like, you make it look really terrible, right? And so do, did any of these kids mention that aspect of it? Yes, and actually there's gender differences there. I don't think any of the men brought up TikTok or social media. 
uh, and that's I, like I don't know how the algorithms work, but yes, the young women did see on TikTok, and they. It was interesting, you know, because some of them would say like, "Oh, I saw this, and like I think this is a really nice way of parenting," and then some of them say, "Well, like." you see the gentle parenting memes on TikTok, but I know that's not what it's really like. And so there's, you know, they have a range of attitudes toward that, but they, they're aware of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was also wondering, because you interviewed them during COVID, so did they talk about COVID and like parenting at all? It's so interesting, most of them didn't, no. There were a few people who were like, um, you know, somebody who like his sister had young kids. And so he said like, I saw my sister with her kids at home and that looked really hard and challenging. But for most of them, no, like it wasn't, uh, you know, and we asked explicitly in the first few interviews, like, did COVID change your plans around any of this? And everyone was like, no, why would that happen? And so then we stopped asking. <laughs> but yeah, you know, when it came up, sometimes they'd be like, oh, you know, well, I moved here for school and then we were online, so I didn't meet anybody. So it was sort of like in their lives, but they weren't conceptualizing it as like some big world changing thing. Um, some of you who have read Annette LaRoe's work, this may sound familiar to you. Um, so Annette LaRoe in Unequal Childhoods is looking at the difference between how middle and upper class parents approach parenting and how um, working class and, and poor parents approach parenting. Concerted cultivation is what she labels the like middle and upper class parenting strategy. She identifies four pillars of concerted cultivation, which are treating each child as an individual, equality and mutual respect between parents and children, developing children's unique skills and talents, and discipline via talking and reasoning. So this is like exactly what our participants are talking about. Um, and what's striking is that our participants are talking about this across ranges of family backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So some participants from quite disadvantaged families who did not experience this at all growing up still have this as an ideal as this is what parenting should be. Um, and this, some of this comes from, you know, they say like, well, you know, I grew up in this family and then I like went to college or I went to this fancy high school and I saw like my friends had a very different experience than I did. And some of it they're talking about, I was raised, this, you know, in a certain way and I found that really hard and, you know, disorienting and that's not how I want to raise my children. Um, so this was an ideal for almost everybody in the sample. Um, so the answer to the first question, do people who don't have children have ideas about what it's like to be a parent? Yeah, they do. And some of them are more articulate than others. But if you keep asking, you can find they do. They, they, they can think about it. And they sort of recognize different ways of being, of being a parent. And they think some ways are better than others. So then the second question is, do these ideas about what parenthood is like shape their decisions about whether they want children and when they want to have children and kind of in what circumstances they want to have children? So most of the people in the sample wanted to have children at some point, about three quarters of them. Um, three participants said they definitely or probably didn't want to have children, and then six weren't sure, were sort of waiting to decide, or maybe they said it sort of depends on what my partner wants. Um, but the way people talked about parenthood was pretty similar among those who did want children and those who didn't want children. So we asked in a bunch of different ways about like, what do you think you would like about being a parent? What's good about being a parent? What would you enjoy? Or what are you worried about? What do you think would be hard? And we got the same answers, pretty similar answers across most people. It was just that how they weighed these kind of pros and cons of parenthood was different for the people who said, yes, I definitely want kids versus no, I definitely don't want kids. Um, but we, when we asked about the appeal of being a parent, you know, people said like, it's just fun to spend time with kids. I enjoy kids, kids are funny. People talked about getting pleasure out of um, teaching kids or sort of mentoring kids or sort of like helping kids to develop their potential. And then there were also some sort of more like altruistic or outward focused ways of talking about being a parent. So Bart, for example, said, if you did a really good job, you could make a good person in the future. And that good person would have an impact on the world and make the world be better. And that would be a, a reason to be a parent is that you could sort of make the world better that way. This was a thing that came up uh, for a lot of people. Um, in contrast, when we looked at the fears and worries or sort of things you wouldn't like about being a parent, a lot of people talked about the physical demands of bearing children and raising children, you know, running around after kids. People talked about kids being gross. I don't know if that counts as a physical demand. Um, I mean, especially women talked about pregnancy and childbirth as being, you know, something they were worried about. Some men actually also talked about that on behalf of their partners, especially, you know, partnered men who had actual partners who they were thinking about. Um, everybody talked about financial costs of children. Uh, and then, you know, so again, if you think of these as being sort of like 
don't want to say selfish, but sort of reasons for not having children having to do with you and your experience. And then there were some sort of more altruistic reasons for not have children, having children. Um, so Melina said kind of, she didn't want to have sure she was worried about having children because of kind of how crazy the world can be. And this was also a common idea that the world is kind of like not doing that well and that maybe you didn't want to bring children into this world. Um, people did talk about COVID a little bit in that, but more in the sense of like COVID revealed a lack of trust or sort of showed things that were already happening. So I'm just thinking you had three non-binary people and you're asking them about childbirth and, and having children. And so I'm just wondering how did they speak about their intentions and was there an interaction between their, their gender ideology that they're holding and their biology. Yeah, and we did, actually, we were a little careful. So we talked about having children. We didn't talk about bearing children. And then we did ask explicitly, you know, how are you going to bring your children into your life? Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, so, and people had different answers to that. A lot of people actually, of all gender identities, said, oh, I, I definitely want to adopt children. I don't want to bear a child, but I want to have a child. I want to be a parent. Um, there was at least one of the non-binary participants who said, you know, like, I don't want to bear a child myself. Like, my partner's also non-binary. I don't know if they want to bear a child. So that was sort of like part of what they were thinking about. Mm -hmm. But we did try to separate the, like, being a parent from the bearing a child. Got it. Um, it was interesting, too. There were actually some women in the sample who said, like, I feel a lot of pressure as a woman to have a child and I that makes me mad that like people expect that of me so that it also plays in there. So one thing that I don't see on here is anything about their partners, right? So, you know, one thing that I feel like I'm really surprised I'm not hearing is like part of the appeal of being a parent is doing something with your partner, mm -hmm. right? Parenting with your partner or like a fear or worries like, well, divorce seems high. Like I wouldn't want to do it on my own, right? Or I worry that I'm not going to find a partner that I want to do this with. And did that come up and how did yeah. that come up? And I'm not talking about it that much just because I don't want to, I have it in a couple slides. Like okay. I just, it's like a, a kind of a different thing and I don't want to get okay. into it too much. It, I mean, so, I'm trying to think of a breakdown. You know, some proportion of the sample was like in a partnership that they thought would last forever. And like, I'm actually thinking about having kids or not having kids with this person. Right. A lot of people were not partnered or within partnerships that they didn't think would go on. Um, so that was definitely 100% in the conversation and in the way they were thinking about it. And there's a lot of variation. For some people it really was, and for some people it really wasn't. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, I wanted to follow up about adoption. So. Uh, did you have like uh, how many or uh, in percentage of them talked about adoption versus uh, bearing children or having biological children? So, yeah. Uh, like, uh, maybe like yeah. Just uh, I just w was wondering like maybe there is also like somewhere where you could compare how it was like ten years before because I kind of feel like maybe right now there is more towards adoption rather than having biological children, but I'm not sure. About yeah, I, can't, I haven't looked at the percentages. Um, I was really, you know, a lot of people, you know, so we asked them and then we asked explicitly about adoption. And a lot of people, when you say explicitly, would you ever consider adoption, would say like, oh yeah, sure, of course I'd consider it. But more people than I thought said, you know, volunteered themselves that this was their primary way. And this was actually something I was wondering about. Mm -hmm. One of my assessments of that was that um, Ohio is a place where there's a lot of opioid problems and there's a lot of kids who need foster parents. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of, I think that like, I think a lot of churches in Ohio are like pushing fostering. Mm -hmm. I think like, I don't know if it's like people coming into the high schools. Mm -hmm. But so I was wondering if that was kind of an Ohio specific thing that like people really had the need for foster parents and adoptive parents on their mind. But I don't, that's like purely speculation. I don't have a good sense of that. About the first two reasons for being a parent, did any of the participants differentiate between spending time with just their own children compared to versus they just can't spend time and enjoy spending time with any children or even like not their own. Yeah, and people talked about, we asked people if they had had like a lot of experience spending time with children. So um, a couple people in the sample had like had younger siblings that they had done a lot of sort of had a lot of child raising experience with their younger siblings. People had nieces and nephews. Um, you know, some of the women in the sample had worked as nannies. 
And so they talked about that as like, I really like nannying, and so I know I like spending time with children. Or like, I like spending time with my nieces and nephews, but I like going home at the end of the night and not spending time with them. So that, yeah, the, 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 the sort of, some of, I think this is sort of where more the idea of like my own children would be something specific, whereas the spending a time with, ch with children is sometimes more general of like, like all children are fun. Are there, are there some who said uh, it's just natural to have children or the children are represent uh, continuity, uh, children make family? Uh, yeah. Non-individualistic sort of motivation. Uh, we were talking about this at lunch. There, I think the, the people talked about like, you know, carrying on the family name or something like that. But I think what was more common was people talked about like, I really enjoyed my parents. I can see that they got pleasure out of me. Like, I like that relationship and I want to carry that relationship forward. But there was this idea of like, yeah, like it's sort of, um, it's part of being a, like a person and an adult is having a family and having children. Um, that sort of brings purpose to life. People talked about that in those abstract ways. Uh, yeah, I don't know why I didn't um, single that out. I should. The question that I had asked was, why do people have children? And we got some people who were just saying, well, it's natural to have children. And there's a, we asked for people who said they wanted to have children, actually for both, whether they said they wanted or didn't want, we said sort of like, how did you know? Like, is there a moment when you came to that decision? Um, and especially for women in the sample, they often said, you know, like, well, I always assumed I wanted children. And then at a certain point, I started thinking about, like, oh, I can actually make that decision. And some of them said, like, no, I really decided that I did want children. And some of them said, like, no, I actually thought about it. And, like, once I realized I could make that decision, I decided I didn't. Um, so it's, there is a sort of phase of, like, of a transition from just, like, accepting it as natural to, a, like, making an actual decision. Did you talk with your um, respondents at all about what would happen if they got pregnant by accident? We did not ask that. Some people volunteered that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to talk next about timing. So like some people said, like, when I really want to have a child is whenever. But like, if I got pregnant now, it'd be fine. And I would right. manage it. And some people said, like, no, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't manage it if I got pregnant now. Yeah. Well, you kind of touched on it a little bit. But was there a strong correlation between like how pe uh, children, how the participants felt about their relationship with their own parents and whether or not they wanted to have children? There really wasn't like you know some people like so there's a sort of positive view of like my parents were great I love my relationship with my mom and so I want to have kids so I can you know like have a best friend like my mom had in me and some people said like my parents were terrible and I think I can do a better job than them so like I want to have children so it's really like you know people incorporate that in their narrative but they incorporate it both ways. Yeah, I have a question about time spent with the parents before leaving home. Whether it's something that can affect uh, the child's decision or someone's decision to want to have their own children. Yeah, and I, um, I, I am going to move on a little bit because there is a point that um, that I, I think addresses that very directly. But that was a thing that, like, when people felt like they hadn't spent enough time with their parents, when people felt like my parents are too busy or like my dad wasn't around that was a problem that they wanted to correct in their own parenting. Like that was the thing of like, I know I didn't like that. And so if I have my own children, I'm going to be sure to really spend time with them or to really connect with them in different ways. Um, actually, I'm pay attention to time. OK. So in terms of timing for children, so there's actually, you know, there's not that much variation in whether people want children or not. I mean, there is some variation, but a lot of people in the sample want to have children. Um, and of those who wanted children, nobody wanted them right away. So most people wanted kids like maybe in their late 20s, maybe in their early 30s, maybe in their mid 30s, but like definitely not now. But they had different ways of talking about why I don't want children now. Um, one was around this physical health and capacity. This was actually mostly around, you know, having kids sooner especially for women, but like men too, talked about like, I want to be able to run around with my kids and be active with my kids. Um, a few people talked about like, you know, like your 20s are a time for having fun and I want to have fun in my 20s and then I want to have children later. Um, the two things that I want to talk about in more depth today 
are the connection of like just having children around like other transitions to adult roles like I want to finish school maybe I want to get married um, and a sort of broader idea about stability like you need to be stable before you have kids and I want to talk a little bit about what people meant by stability and how they were thinking about stability um, when people talk about transitions to adult roles you know they talked about like well I definitely want to finish school before I have kids you know, maybe I want to get a good job, or I want to get the next promotion, or I want to sort of like hit some career marker. A lot of people talk about buying a house before they're having kids. Um, I'm not going to talk about marriage and stable partnership, but that did come up a lot for people. Um, but these things, for the most part, were not like super clearly connected to how they were talking about being a parent. They, people said, you know, like, well, like, of course I want to finish school before I have a kid. Or, like, of course I want to buy a house before I have a kid. But then they would sort of say, like, well, of course I want to buy a house. But actually, like, if you think about it, you can buy, raise a kid in an apartment just fine. So, like, maybe I don't really need to buy a house. Or, like, well, it's better to have a stable job. But, like, you know, maybe you won't get that far. And, like, you know, poor people deserve to have kids, too. So, like, I don't know that, you know, like, this is my goal. But I, I have some flexibility around. Um, so, for example, two examples here. Um, Leslie uh, was 18 when we interviewed her, a black woman who's enrolled in a two-year college. She wants to get married and have her husband support her so that she can raise children, and she's not sort of really thinking about work. And the interviewer asked her, when would you envision starting a family? I mean, I would hope to by 25, but realistically, whenever I'm married with money, okay. The interviewer says, yeah, married, money. Leslie says, yeah, house, stable, yeah. The interviewer says, why 25? And Leslie says, I don't know. I feel like that's a good age. And it's like kind of young. I don't know. I like want to. I would have a kid like tomorrow, but that's not a good idea. <laughs> so she has this general idea of like, I want to get to this place, but like, it's not going to change me to get to this place. Like, I'm ready. Like, I could do these things. I'm just sort of like, I have this target in mind, but it's not about my capacity. Um, similarly, Ashley. I uh, was 19 when we interviewed her, a white woman who's enrolled in four-year college and she wants a career in law enforcement. And the interviewer asked her, when do you think you'll feel ready to have kids? I know you said an age, but when might you feel ready kind of emotionally and intellectually, if you know what I mean? And Ashley says, I don't want to get pregnant now, but if I did, I think I'd be fine. I could be a mom right now. But definitely there are things I want to do before having a family, like finishing college and getting a job that I really want. So I don't know, it would just be more of a time thing. So again, like, she has these goals, but they're not related to her sort of internal processes of being ready for parenthood or being prepared for parenthood. Um, and that's in contrast to the way people talked more broadly about ideas of stability before having children. So people talk about financial stability before having children, and people talked really a lot about emotional stability before having children, of getting into a place like with your mental health and with your emotions and with your self-regulation before you had children. Um, so when they were talking about financial stability, they, talk, you know, they were talking about money, they were talking about material res resources for having children. But again, they very much recognized that like, I'm not gonna say, the, you know, they didn't wanna say you have to be rich to have kids. They said like, I wanna be financially stable, but I know that you, know, you can have kids in different circumstances. So what they talked about beyond just sort of material resources, they talked about sort of like planning or judgment or saving, like sort of having good sense about money as a marker of like a more general kind of maturity or stability. And they talked about money not just in terms of material resources, but money as providing them the capacity to be the kind of parent they wanted to be emotionally. Um, so Andre, for example, uh, was 22 when we interviewed him. He's a black man, he's enrolled in a PhD program in a STEM field. Um, he has very specific career plans. So he's gonna, like, he wanted to run his own business first, applying his scientific knowledge, um, and then make a lot of money, come back to teach in a university later. He was doing this, uh, like, a retirement plan, so he planned to retire by age 45. So he had this, like, very complicated investment plan that was gonna let him retire by age 45. <laughs> Um, he was in a romantic relationship with someone who he was like pretty sure they were going to get married. She wanted to have two kids, he wanted to have four kids, so he thought they'd probably compromise at three, and they were going to start having children when he was 30. Mm -hmm. So he, he has a plan. <laughs> um, he was raised by a single mother, and he thinks, you know, his mom did a good job, he really loves his mom and respects his mom, but he does think he didn't get to spend enough time with his mother when he was growing up, and he kind of regrets that, that he didn't get to spend enough time for her. 
So the interviewer asks Andre what needs to happen in order for you to feel prepared to have children. So Andre starts by talking about financial stability. He says, monetarily, I need to get to where I want to be, which is a ways away, but financially, I want to be able to support a kid well enough when there's no questions about safety or anything. I want to have enough for a house. I want to live in a house before I have my first kid. I want to have like a solid job or already be making consistent money is my main thing, not even like a job. I could be doing my other career plans already, but I want to have a job, a solid way of making money. And then make sure that safety component's there. So here he's really talking about money in terms of material resources, a house, safety, stability. Then he goes on to say, mentally, I want to be at a kind of maturity level where I can acknowledge the responsibility I'm taking on and know that I'm basically doing this at the right time. I don't want to do it and feel like I'm not prepared for this. I want to mentally be like, yes, I want to do this. This is great, this is ideal, and this is the right time, and everything like that. So I want to mentally be prepared, feel like I have the patience, the knowledge, and the tools to basically support the child and give him or her the best life possible. So this is kind of connecting that idea of financial support, giving the child the best life possible, but in a broader picture of maturity, of readiness, of preparedness that's not just about the material resources. And when the interviewer asks later on, um, you mentioned the part of the influence on how you're planning your life is that you grew up poor. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? So he says, you know, like, we grew up, like, I had everything I needed. I didn't necessarily have everything I wanted. He says, something I really took away was that how hard my parent worked. They provided as much as I could, and I appreciate it, because I did basically have everything I wanted. But it caused there to be a time difference, where basically I didn't really get to spend as much time with them and learn as much about them as I would have liked. Especially in those adolescent years, I didn't necessarily develop that attachment, that strong enough attachment. I think that would have been really beneficial and created that kind of like bond. So with that, I wanted to do that for my children in the future. Part of the retiring early, having that more time to spend with my family, is like, I want to be a parent where I'm always able to spend time with my kids, doing their homework, spend time with them if we want to go to different music parks or vacations. I always want to be able to financially provide for them, but then also have the time to be like, yeah, of course, let's go. And I think that's like a super valuable impact. So Andre is very clearly thinking about money in terms of buying time to spend up with his children, planning to retire early as a way of strategizing his financial life to provide him the resources to be there with his children. And we heard this in different ways from different participants as well. So a lot of people talked about money, using money to buy domestic tasks. So, you know, buy someone to do cooking or buy someone to do cleaning so that you could spend time with your children. And people also talked about money as sort of freeing up mental bandwidth that if you were worried about money all the time, you wouldn't be able to also be worried about your children. You would be distracted from paying attention to your children. And the reason you needed to be stable about money is so that you could be focused on your children and sort of demote, devote your emotional energy to the children. So in this case, this financial stability is very clearly a tool that's closely linked to the way that Andre wants to be a parent and how he's thinking about what it means to be a good parent. Um, and a big part of what that means to be a good parent is that emotional connection with children. So we also saw people talking about emotional stability as an important precursor for parenthood. That the most important thing a parent could do was meet children's emotional needs. And you couldn't do that as a parent unless you had first met your own emotional needs and identified and processed your own emotional needs. Um, so Mac was 20 when we interviewed her. She was a white woman enrolled in a four-year college. She had started off at one school, took a semester off, and was back in school again when we talked to her. Um, she had a couple different career plans that she was thinking about. One of the possibilities was that she was going to move outside of the U.S. She thought it would be much easier to have children if she lived outside the U.S. Um, because there would be more public support for having children. Um, she had a pretty challenging childhood. She had two younger brothers, and her mother was sort of very occupied with having three children and was... Um, you know, there was a lot of yelling and a lot of tension in her relationship with her mother. Uh, her father worked a lot and wasn't home a lot, and there was tension in the relationship between her parents as well. So there was, she said, there was a lot of yelling in the household. Um, and then when she was in elementary school, her mother was diagnosed with cancer, went through treatment for a few years, and then passed away a few years later. Um, and I should say, this was actually, you know, this was sort of an extreme story, but we had a lot of participants, I mean, surprising to me maybe, um, as an upper middle class white woman, we had a lot of participants who like went through quite traumatic experiences in their childhood, and that was something that they talked to us about. Um, so when Mac's mother was in treatment and then after she passed away, Mac had a lot of responsibility for raising her younger brothers. 
Uh, and that caused some tension between her and her father. She says now her relationship with her father is better because she's moved out of her house. But she's still, you know, sort of thinking a lot about her experience growing up and how she might want things to be different. Um, so the interviewer asked, what did raising your brothers look and feel like? And Max says, so everything I implemented into raising them was stuff that my mom had, like, been on me about. So, like, yelling was something she did a lot, like, all the time. So for my brothers, if they weren't listening, it was just like, okay, like, I have to be louder than the two kids in this room. And then eventually I figured out that that didn't work. And for whatever reason, I got super into reading mom blogs because I was like, okay, well, like, they're not going to listen to me. I need them to listen to me. So, like, guess I better go find a parent who knows what they're talking about. And so I kind of figured out how to be more lenient with them and understand that they were going through the same stuff I was. And that, like, yeah, the things that I'm trying to get them to do maybe won't work with them that worked with me. But I kind of have to give them some space to mess things up and have emotions, because my mom had not let them do that, specifically with the youngest one. So you can see here these ideas, like some of the themes that we saw that I talked about earlier. The idea that different children need different things and you have to, like, meet each child's individual needs. And the idea that a, a core thing about parenting is recognizing the kids' emotions and letting them have those emotions and helping them manage those emotions, you know, in a better way rather than in a worse way. So Mac is thinking about this kind of emotional connection and she's thinking about herself and whether she wants to have children. And that's an important part of her decision-making process. So the interviewer asks, so what do you think, just broadly speaking, what does it mean to be a good parent? So Matt's talking, Max's talking about some examples. She says, you know, like, you can't just yell at the kids. You need to reason with them. You need to explain things with them and, like, help them understand why these are the rules. And she says, and I know parenting like that, it takes time. It's not easy. And that's part of the reason it's difficult for me to want to have kids, because I still have a lot of stuff that I have to work through. I have anger issues every once in a while. I'm very impatient. Kids yelling makes me so upset, even though that's how they express their emotions. I can't blame a kid for that. So just relearning how to parent yourself, or the ways that you were short, whatever, helps the way that you're supposed to develop better humans, because that takes time. That's not just a simple thing. So as Mac is thinking about whether she wants to have children and when she's going to be ready to have children, this is the thing that's sort of most pressing to her, is seeing my parents didn't do this emotional work on themselves. They didn't parent me well. I'm trying to process this. Um, and I think what's interesting about this emotional stability thing, as opposed to some of the like transition to adulthood markers, like you can say, I know when I'm gonna graduate school. Um, you can say, I know they're on a two year promotion cycle at work. You might not know when you're gonna be able to buy a house, but like you at least will know like, I've bought a house. Mm -hmm. Whereas this kind of emotional stuff, not only, you, know, you can't really predict the timeline. And also participants were very aware of like, I don't know, I don't know how I'm gonna recognize like when I'm together enough, or when I'm patient enough, or when I'm healed enough. So the kind of timeline of this kind of stability and preparedness is much less predictable for them. Um, and what time is it? I'll talk a little bit now. Um, I think this is, this connects very well with some of um, Jennifer Silva's work among transition to adulthood among working class young adults in the United States, in which she finds that for people where sort of external markers of adulthood are harder to reach. If you don't feel like you have good career options or good school options, the thing that feels under your control is kind of your internal development, your psychological development, like processing your own mental health. And so that in some ways comes as an alternative pathway to adulthood. You have the external markers and then you also have the emotional stability piece. I think that's very consistent with how participants in our sample talked about this. Um, and one of the things that I'm very interested in, we don't have any plans to do a longitudinal follow-up, but I would love to do a longitudinal follow-up. I mean, I think many people had very clear ideas about how their life was gonna unfold. And, you know, as a sociologist from the outside, you can say, like, probably most people's plans are not gonna unfold exactly <laughs> the way they want to. Um, and how, they, how the way that they talk about this emotional stability piece might change as their other goals, you know, become easier to reach or become harder to reach. Are they going to say, like, well, I can't do any of these other things, but at least now I'm emotionally stable so I can have kids? Mm -hmm. Or are they going to say, like, I'm never going to be emotionally stable so I never have kids? So that's, I, I'm, that is the sort of piece of it that I think would be most interesting to see evolve. Um, so 
So I'm going to just quick summarize. Do people have models of parenthood before they have children? Yes, they do. They're pretty much what Annette LaRoe calls considered cultivation, and they're quite consistent across participants from all kinds of family backgrounds. Do these ideas about parenting shape plans for when to have children? This is kind of a more complicated answer, again, because people's ideas about parenthood are pretty similar. Their plans for having children are less similar. Um, everybody wants to wait. Everybody talks about financial stability. For a lot of people, this emotional piece is more pressing even than the financial piece, or sort of they see it as like more of a baseline. But it's very hard to predict how that will unfold over time. Um, and how that will be connected to their desired timeline for childbearing over time. Um, so we have you know, lots to do with refining the analysis, particularly around variation and sort of how the different ways people talk about emotional stability, financial stability, are, you know, might vary across the sample. Um, you might notice that the example I gave talking about financial stability was a man. The example I gave talking about emotional stability was a woman. Um, I don't think it's the case that men in our sample don't talk about emotions, but I think it might be the case that women see the financial piece as less up to them. Um, so I think there's likely some gender differences there. We would love to do some longitudinal follow-up. Not sure if that's in the cards. Um, and we would love to do some large-scale data collection to try to think about, you know, are there ways to put this into survey questions? Are there ways to do this at the population level to think about how this is explaining some of these bigger picture trends um, that I started out with? So, and we're open to suggestions for what we think you should do next. And you've given me some suggestions for ideas to look at in this, uh, in this analysis. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if you can do longitudinal follow-up, I would highly recommend it. I did research totally unrelated to parenting. I, I followed a group of um, working class, first generation university students into their 30s. And I never asked about parenting, but what happened is exactly what you think is going to happen. The ones who had children by their mid-30s were the ones who achieved that kind of stability. They were the ones who had finished their education, who were no longer postdocs or doing something else, who had stable jobs, who were in relationships. So that kind of stability seemed to really be predicting the ones who had children by them. I never asked them what their plans were. Yeah. Before, but you did, so you could ask Yeah, them. exactly. And I think there's actually like two things that we might expect. I mean, so as Kate said in the introduction, a lot of my work has been on unintended childbearing in the United States, which has been, it is mostly in the US, young people who, have, who start having children before they plan to, and is mostly people from less advantaged family backgrounds. Unintended birth rates in the US recently have gone down. And I think we're seeing the emergence of a pattern where it's the better off people who are having children, who are achieving their childbearing goals, and it's the people who never reach this kind of stability who are kind of blocked from achieving parenthood. But they're also more rational about their choices, right? So they wait till they, they wait till they finish their education. They have their children maybe later. It's, it's a, there's a rationality around that, in, at least in the sample that I use. Yeah, I mean, there's a rationality and there's also a capacity. You know, it's, right, yes, it's not yes. worth making plans around things you never feel like you're going to be able to achieve. So seeing how those two things play out, I think, would be really interesting. Yeah, so good luck. <laughs> yeah. Rachel. Um, one question is whether you get a sense that the respondents were aware that putting off fertility too long leads to a higher risk of not being able to. And some of my students have mentioned that they started getting ads around the time they turned 20 or 22 for freezing their eggs. And um, we were talking about this at lunch too. Right? So this is something that um, apparently is like very big on social media for women in their 20s. Um, and so is that something that anyone talked about? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I'm trying to think. Lots of women talked about it. I'm trying to think if any men talked about it. Um, but yes, you know, several people said, like, I know my mom had a hard time, so I think I might have a hard time. Some of them said, like, I know I have various issues that might make it a hard time. There was actually, now I'm thinking about, there was one man who had a partner who he said, like, I know she might have issues, and so we're thinking about that. And that was, like, the timing issue was very much um, on their minds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fascinating. I, I could listen to more and, and Andre that guy has it together. He, <laughs> I mean he's the 
Mark said, like, you want to see him in five years because he has it laid out and, you know, <laughs> he's, things are hard. These paragraphs better organized than, our, than, than many students can write their essays. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, so one thing that, um, so in the demography classes we've, we've talked about, I just asked, you know, about, about you know, fertility tensions and, and people said the exact same three things. So uh, <laughs> education, uh, occupation, and housing or financial stability. And like I'm like, well, nobody mentioned a partner. And then everybody sort of went like, well, yeah, that's you. <laughs> and you're finding the same thing. And anecdotally, I don't know this literature, anecdotally, just as a media uh, consumer, uh, among older, sort of in their, in, among thir people in their 30s, starting, to, especially women, starting to think, okay, I better, I better get this going or else, finding the partner seems to be the key. So. Is that at all just sort of they've already achieved everything, now they get to think about the last bit? Or is it, uh, how, do you, how does one think about it, it, it? Or do you just have a distorted notion of what's going on uh, in terms of? So it's, there's actually a really big variety. Um, so some people, you, you know, there's sort of like every category that you could think of, there's people in it. So there's some people who say like, well, I don't really care that much about having kids. If I have a partner who really wants kids, then I will have them. If I have a partner who doesn't want kids or I'm unpartnered, I won't. Um, some people said, I want kids 100% and I don't care if I have a partner or, lot or not. Some people said like, well, I want kids, but it, I don't want to have kids by myself. So like it's contingent on having a partner. And some people, again, like that 18 to 24 age range is a pretty big age range. Um, so, you know, like the 18 year olds are like not even worried about anything, but you know, some of the, some of the people in the, in the later ages of that are sort of thinking about like, well, uh, you know, I'm going to, I want to have kids when I'm 28 and I'm 23 now and I'm not dating anybody. And when that's, when's that going to be? There's some people who are sort of like doing it in the interview where they're like, oh, I'm counting back. And I realize yeah. like, um, so there's just really people across the board and even like what people mean when they say they want to be partnered to have a kid I mean I think Rachel you were talking about this like about raising a kid with a partner so some people it was very much about like we well, need two people because you need money or because you need like you just need two parents to run after the kids or you know the sort of like practical components of it and some people you know especially the people in relationships were thinking about raising kids with that specific partner um, people talked about like getting on the same page about parenting with their partner, you know, if like, well, my partner was brought up this way and I was brought up this different way and how are we going to think about having kids together? So there, there was just a huge range in how people were talking about the partnership stuff in this sample. So really interesting. I was so excited to, to see the qualitative stuff here and, and our chat at lunch, but okay. so. Concerted cultivation, that seems to be the theoretical uh, framework that is most applicable to what people are saying about their intentions for rearing children. But that concerted cultivation has also a lot of negatives. And one of the things that we see is stress and anxiety, kind of a coddling of, of children. And so I'm wondering if any participants raise those types of concerns. Like, it sounds very much like a, a a bourgeois way of rearing children that people who might not have the resources historically to do that are now expected to rear their children in this way that can then also like leads to stress and anxiety and all of these types of things did anyone see that type of reflection that they reflect on this in any way so have you thought about it so it's also interesting um I think there's two pieces with the concerted cultivation, right? Like, so the one is um, the like activities and enrichment and pushing my kids to get good grades and making them do after school stuff. And then there's the kind of like emotional pieces of like talking to my kid like a person and respecting right. them to, as a person and interacting with them as a person. And again, because these were relatively young kids, I shouldn't call them kids because these young people, <laughs> these young adults are relatively far away from having children. They are not thinking about like the overscheduled child. They're really thinking about this emotional relationship. And some of them, like a few of them did say like, did talk about feeling overscheduled themselves or like did yeah. feel about like anxiety around the achievement. You feel like there's this anxiety or stress about yeah. being a parent, mm -hmm. right? Which could also come from their own upbringing 
uh, if they had helicopter parents that did a concerted cultivation type rearing with them. And they did not, like people talked about helicopter parenting, they saw that as very distinctive from this kind of like emotionally attuned parenting. Like they made a distinction between like, my mom wants to know where I am all the time and like won't leave me alone versus like what I really want my mom to do is like understand why I'm stressed out about this exam and like tell me, you know, help me not to be stressed about it. So they, they separated those two pieces of the concerted cultivation. Um, and I would say also like a lot of their anxiety is around the stakes, right? Like the U.S. is a very unequal society. They know that, they see that. And so they were very worried about messing up their kids and the messing up their kids is it like because it would make their kids unhappy or because it would make their kids have a hard time. Or it would, and if like, they don't get into the right preschool, they don't get into the right high school. But again, like they, they're, they're not talking about that. No. It's, I mean, it's very interesting to me. I expected them, you know, even the ones who had that upbringing aren't talking about that upbringing. Yeah, Laura. Um, I guess kind of following up on what John was saying, something, I don't know that this is like a question, and I don't know that this is in your data, but I would love to hear your thoughts if it is something you could speak to. But with the concerted cultivation piece and the emotional aspects of it specifically, there is some aspect of it that feels like, oh, is this kind of, um, um, is the parenting styles of kind of like the, the more powerful socioeconomic group in society now trickling down? But then I was also thinking separately from that, though, there does seem to be my understanding in this generation of, of young people a um, much greater awareness of and acceptance of the importance of mental health, right? And that's completely independent of parents, parenting styles altogether. And so I'm just wondering how much of that kind of I don't know. Again, I don't. I, I don't imagine that you queried query this specifically, but I am thinking about like how much of this is actually just that kids these days are like better at thinking about this than we were. Like, yeah, and I think like as a follow up from Sean's question, that works really well because they're very much thinking about it in that way. They're thinking about mental health, like they're thinking about <laughs> happiness, they're thinking about emotions. They're not thinking about you know raising their kids to go to the right college, and I think. You know, in like empirically in Nat LaRoe's work, those two things go together, the like sort of emotional connection to the child and the like parenting for success. And so maybe um, I'm like talking out loud, I'm talking through this as I'm yeah. saying it, but I think like maybe that's the sort of like intervention here is separating out the emotional intensity from the stratification piece of it, for lack of a better word. And that also, I think, it's easier for people to think about that emotional piece in the abstract, separate from specific kids and specific choices you're making about those kids. So there are some parallels between the convergence by SES and the requirements of parenthood with a lot of Kathy Eden's work that talks about the economic prerequisites to marriage being very similar. Do you think, based on the different interviews that you've shown, like it's kind of evinces the fact that potentially parenthood may be becoming this symbolic uh, marker or symbolic status the same way that marriage had become for low SES individuals? I think so, and I think that's again where the like longitudinal follow-up would be really interesting. I think very much the people in the sample think about parenthood as something you have to work for and prepare yourself for and get ready for, and it's like the culmination of this process of working on yourself and your emotional stability. and you know, how, what's going to happen to that, I don't know, you know, are they going to, how are they going to think about those standards five years down the road, I think is an important question, but very much, and this, this wasn't um, what we were thinking about in the project, so I didn't really talk about it, but there's interesting things that people talk about, like adulthood, people talk about like, well, I'm not really, I'm kind of an adult, or like, I'm a baby <laughs> adult, or I'm like working towards being adult. But there's interesting things about transition to adulthood in here too. And again, like that sort of like emotional piece, I think is very much part of how they're thinking of the transition to adulthood. And they're thinking that parenthood should come at the end of that, not at the beginning of that. And I have a follow-up question. Your like qualitative work is mirrors very closely like Patrick Yusufa's work that talks yeah. about the convergence, right? What do you think accounts for that convergence in, in, in your view? I mean, that's a good question. And I think that's, that's also in some ways the longitudinal piece of, is it, because so Annette LaRoe's book was published in 2003. She was doing her field work in the 90s. Like, is it that this idea has trickled down from the upper classes to everyone? 
Or is it this case that this was always everyone's ideals and that people without a lot of money, in fact, can't implement these ideals and so their practice ends up differently? So I think that's also what I would be very interested in the longitudinal piece is if and when differences emerge, you know, are the, are the differences that we observed based on ideals or on resources? So like the parents that Annette Leroux was watching in the 90s were boomers, right? Mm -hmm. And the parents of these kids are Gen Xers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some range yeah. in the parents' age, but right. yeah. But they're like Gen Xers or mil early millennials. If they I'm trying kids, to think, like, are the parents, parents in this sample the kids in, are Annette LaRose kids the age of their parents, maybe? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. Maybe, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so these parents were born, like, in the 70s and 80s, so that make them yeah, Gen so X. Yeah, so Gen X and early millennials. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's all financial stability and mental stability like that part I find really interesting and um, so with the case of Andrew like he was sure in terms of like what kind of steps he had to take to reach financial stability but with mental stability he sort of just said like I'm just waiting for that moment to happen and he doesn't have any plans versus with Mac like I feel like she's also the same but like she has some plan but very abstract like reparenting herself like does that happen like in terms of how they reach their mental stability and the sample that you interviewed? Yeah, so we asked them some of them like, so like, what are you actually doing? And some of them would be like, well, I'm in therapy and I'm working on therapy or like, you know, I'm having my mental health issues addressed. And some of them, it was much more abstract, like, you know, I'm just observing my emotions and how I respond to them. And I think that is the that also sort of relates to the more abstract nature of the mental health stuff. Like even the people who are very, you know, who are in therapy, who are reading self-help books, who are sort of doing things around the idea of emotional stability, it's, there's fewer concrete steps that you can take and maybe, or maybe a different way of putting it is there's fewer concrete outcomes to measure the emotional stability piece. Um, some people did say like, you know, when I get closer to being a parent, then I'm going to do some things. Like for now, I'm just living my life and not worry about it. But you know, five years from now, I'll start really working on this issue. Do you think that tells something about like what we're missing in the society about like teaching people and giving them resources and how to be mentally prepared? <laughs> <laughs> it would, I mean, it would be interesting, right? If we were talking at lunch about like um, doctors and nurses giving parenting advice, but like. You know, what counts as parenting advice? Like, is the parenting advice the practicalities or is the parenting advice the sort of, like, emotional techniques? Like, I don't think, I don't, I mean, and I don't know the developmental literature that well, but I don't, my sense is there's, like, not a super strong consensus about, like, is there actually, like, a good way to parent? No, I think. I don't think there is. I, I mean, I think there's some bad ways to parent, but, like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, with respect to the broader macro issues you were discussing at the beginning, what do you, do you think are, like, the, policy recommendations that you would give to like governments that would come out of this kind of study or if, if there are I mean my main policy recommendations to governments is like redistribution of wealth and <laughs> burn the rich um, I mean I think like the financial strain is a huge piece of this like whether people talk about it or whether it's like manifested in emotional strain just the precarity of life in the United States is a real barrier to having children. And I think, I mean, I'm also, um, Rachel and I can talk about this. I'm like, I'm not totally sure that it's government's role to tell people to have children or not have children, but I do think like, regardless of whether people have children or not, like improving financial conditions is good for people, is good for health and well-being. Like, is a good thing to do that, you know, we can work on regardless of its demographic implications. Um, I have a question. So, as a consumer of like TikTok and the media, I see a lot of young people talking about and like, complaining about how much easier it was for quote unquote the older generations to have kids, especially financially. I know you said that they weren't really thinking financially, but did they ever mention that about how it's changed and how it's become like more difficult to have kids just strictly in pra like from practicality? They did. I mean, they talked about the concerns of having kids. Um, there was one, I, the stuck in my mind, there was one woman who's like, I've done my research, it costs $500,000 to raise a kid in the United States. I'm like, you know, I'm saving up. Um, so that was definitely a concern. I don't think they, like, necessarily framed it as, like, easier or harder for the past, but they were definitely aware of 
financial burdens. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I want to talk to you about TikTok. I'm very interested in what's, is there, yeah. Yes, uh, I had a methodological question. Uh, with uh, qualitative research, at one point, uh, you feel that you've heard it all and you don't need a larger sample. But sometimes I was wondering how you feel about your sample of 36. Have you, would you prefer to have a larger sample to, to have, uh, and why didn't you uh, collect more? Um, well, why didn't we indeed? <laughs> um, I think I feel good about the sample as described of a sample of young people enrolled in post-secondary education. I do think we've reached that saturation at that point. Mm -hmm. I think we just like don't have a good sense of people who aren't enrolled in post-secondary education, how they're thinking about these questions. And that's like a real failure on my part because I, one of the questions that I went into this is like, you know, those are the kids from the most disadvantaged family backgrounds. and. I really wanted to understand how they were thinking about this. Um, and it's just, it's harder to rec recruit people who aren't attached to institutions. Um, and if I had had, you know, more time and more effort to devote to this, I would have done more on it and, you know, but there's only so many hours in the day. But I don't, you know, I don't call this project done. So, it, you know, it may be over the next 12 months, I'll, I'll go back and really do a, a more intensive job at trying to find those people. I noticed the ethnicity of the respondents was kind of limited. Was that a conscious decision or? Yeah, the Columbus area, I mean, in the, the, the groups that are missing in the sort of US population um, are uh, Hispanic young adults and Asian and Asian American young adults. And those are groups that are less represented in the Columbus area. And because you know, this was my first qualitative project. It's a relatively small sample. I felt better about having a sort of like more restricted sample on characteristics with kind of less variation to deal with in the sample. And that, you know, like whether that was the right decision or not, who knows, but it's certainly, you know, it's certainly an, a thing to think about in thinking about this sample. Did you have a question? Yes, thank you for your presentation. It's inspiring. If you have to go back and start from scratch, what would you include or exclude? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, the question, the recruiting people who are not in school is a big gap, and I would have focused more on that earlier on and sort of thought more carefully about where the challenges would be there. I think. You know, we had some questions about COVID, which like nobody just had anything interesting to say about COVID. You know, I, maybe it was good to have them in there just so we knew that that wasn't something that people were thinking about. Um, we didn't ask explicitly about siblings and a lot of people ended up talking about siblings. Um, people talked about raising their younger siblings, people talked about their nieces and nephews and like sort of seeing their siblings parent. Um, people talked about their parent, like their siblings had a different experience growing up than they did, um, you know, especially people with half siblings or step siblings. So I think that would be maybe another piece of it that would have been interesting to pursue, um, the, the sort of sibling relationship component. Did any other respondents talk about growing up being co-parented across different households and like how that worked for them or didn't work for them? Does that play into their ideas about family? Yes, and again, that was a thing where that was like both, some people had really good experiences being co-parented and some people had really bad experiences being co-parented. So that was like often a source of, you know, a way that people talked about what being a good parent was. Like, well, my mom did this, but my dad did this. And you know, that wasn't good. Um, that came up a lot actually like parents who had remarried one of the good parenting things was like if you get remarried you have to put your kids first and not your new partner first and the bad parenting thing is to put the partner first um, but yeah that I mean that and that you know in the sample of this age group yeah. it's quite a common it's experience common, right? yeah and like I feel like there's no research on that right yeah, yeah. and the the sort I think yeah there actually I'm trying to think yeah, if you want to, if you want these data and you want to analyze that, there's yeah. probably enough to like write a paper on that co-parenting yeah. and how people talk about the co-parenting experience. Yeah, and I should say like, I'm a very open source kind of person. If anybody's interested in this, happy to share data. Like, happy to talk to you more about this at any point. Yeah, 
Yeah, I just wanted to circle back to something you said at the beginning was that um, you were thinking about whether there's things that are US specific or COVID specific and you mentioned like one of those things being potentially like adoption due to the opioid epidemic in the area. I guess we're in um, we're in Canada and there are people here from other places. If, I'm wondering if there was anything specific that you were kind of curious about or thinking maybe this doesn't translate or if it was just a general like if anything jumps out at you that like this may be a specific point out. I'm actually curious about this kind of like therapeutic language that people are talking about a lot. I don't know the extent to which that's sort of distinctive to US culture. Mm -hmm. um, I have it here too. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Exactly. And actually, I mean, I do wonder, relative to a lot of places, Columbus is more affordable than some places. Mm -hmm. So I also wonder if some of this, like, some of the stuff around buying a house is more accessible in Columbus than it would be in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether that also affects kind of like the balance between the financial piece and the emotional piece. Maybe does anyone online have a question? Because there's a lot of people online. Yes. That's a, that's a really good idea. Any questions for folks online? Is, where's your the mic? Yeah, the mic's there. <laughs> <laughs>